I'm just going to share my screen here. And let me find that full screen button, which I can never find. Ah, there we go. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So I'd like to welcome you all to the next session of the Science Symposium and our first session on drug discovery. Today we have our judges, Dr. Ashima and Maria, and we also have Jamie joining us to do her presentation. And the Science Symposium is the brainchild and work of Dr. Noeen and who you've all met and seen here. She'll be behind the scenes today. And I'm very fortunate and happy to be joining her as the vice chair and um, chatting with you all today. So before we get started, I'd like to do a quick land acknowledgement and take a moment to reflect on our connection to the land and thank to the traditional guardians of the land that we at Swiss Vancouver live and work on. Uh, we're here in Vancouver today, which is on the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Stolo, and Squamish people. Now, as I said, we're in round two of the Science Symposium and we're doing drug discovery. And Jamie will be the first of our three presenters in this category. And before we get started, I do just have a few housekeeping rules. Uh, today's video, as you know, will be recorded and will be going live or will be put up on YouTube later today. We do ask that everyone mute themselves when they're not speaking to not interrupt Jamie's presentation. And if you have any questions, please put those in the chat box and we will be monitoring that throughout the session to ask during the Q&A session. Now I'll switch over to our judges here and I'll let them each introduce themselves and then we'll let uh, Jamie introduce herself and begin with her presentation. So Dr. Shima, would you like to start? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashima, and I am a research scientist at uh, Quadrico, which is a hardware tech company based out of Toronto, and it is uh, focused on developing these uh, highly specialized analytical instruments for non-invasive disease diagnosis. And uh, before joining Quadrico, I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California. And my research experience spans both uh, theoretical and applied work in structural biology, biochemistry, cellular, and molecular biology. And I'm so glad to be here and looking forward to your presentation, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. And Maria? Just give me a moment. I'm so sorry. No, it's OK. part of the lab. <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm currently a PhD candidate actually at the University of Montreal studying neuroimaging features of psychotic patients. Uh, I've also completed a master's in neuroscience. I've also completed a master's of public health from the University of Essex. Um, and I have also a previous medical science liaison for a biotechnology company. I am also uh, one of the co-founding members for the Quebec chapter of SWIST. I am gonna be future program director of the MS Infinity program, uh, so heavily involved, well, at least hopefully heavily involved in the program, and very much looking forward to your talk today, Jamie, so good luck. Awesome. Thank you. And Jamie, we'll pass it over to you to do a little introduction, and then we can launch right into your presentation. Great, thank you so much. So I'm just going to share my screen while I'm talking about myself here too. So I'm Jamie Corner. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Victoria where I work in the Elvira group, which is where, uh, we're a chemistry group in name, but really we focus on biochemistry and microfluidics, so we're kind of all over the place and really interdisciplinary. Um, and so I'm coming from you here in Victoria, on the Kwangun territory, and I'm gonna tell you guys about my PhD research, which is focused on creating artificial cells on a chip for drug permeability prediction. So predicting drug permeability and absorption across different barriers in the body is a really key part of early stages of drug development, specifically during preclinical research. So I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of different ways that this is done in vitro right now, and then we'll launch into the, the new technique that we've developed in here in our lab. 
So right now, permeability is assessed through a few different techniques, the first of which and the main one is PAMPA, or Parallel Artificial Membrane Permeation Assays. And in PAMPA, um, the permeation of a drug from a donor compartment in an aqueous solution into an acceptor compartment um, is assessed and measured and used to figure out how, how permeable a drug is across a specific membrane. Um, and this yellow section in here represents a synthetic filter, which is filled with an organic solvent that has the main component of cell plasma membranes, phospholipids, dissolved in it. Okay, the next technique that we're going to touch on are liposome, um, liposome assays. So liposomes or vesicles are spherical phospholipid bilayers. And these types of measurements can be done in solution or um, immobilized on a substrate similarly to as similarly as in PAMPA. And either the uptake or the release of a drug through these phospholipid bilayers is also measured over time. Uh, third technique that we are sort of comparing to are cell monolayer assays. So again, there's always there's a donor compartment where a known concentration of drug begins um, and an acceptor compartment that concentration of drug is measured in. But in this case, instead of using just phospholipids, just these molecules, we have a cell, a cultured cell monolayer um, that's grown on this synthetic filter support. And so all of these techniques have advantages and disadvantages. Cell monolayer assays are the most biomimetic and give us the most detailed information about um, drug permeation, but there's also um, there's passive and active transport going on in there, as well as potential side reactions like metabolism happening within the cells. Um, liposomes and PAMPA as well um, give us a little bit more leeway in terms of uh, tuning those phospholipid compositions, um, but that doesn't generally happen. And we get some really simplistic measurements of permeability that don't necessarily mimic um, conditions that are actually happening in the body. And so we propose that um, to improve these systems, we can use something called droplet interface bilayers or DIBs. And DIBs are formed when we have two aqueous droplets surrounded by a bulk oil medium and phospholipids are added to one of those solutions. And when that happens, phos the phospholipids will self-assemble into a monolayer coating the aqueous droplets with their hydrophilic head groups pointing in towards the aqueous droplet and hydrophobic tail groups pointing out into the bulk oil solution. So in each place where these droplets come into contact, we get formation of a phospholipid bilayer. And the phospholipids that are used as well as the contents of these droplets can be tuned to mimic different tissues. In the Elvira lab, we're a microfluidics group, so all of our research that we do involves microfluidic devices. So um, the droplets that are generated here um, are occurring at the intersection of a stream of an aqueous solution and an oil solution. And each droplet winds up being about 100 micrometers wide, or about the width of a human hair. And these droplets are pushed by the oil flow throughout the rest of a set of, of channels um, that allow us to control droplet position and bring them really gently into contact to form dibs. And so this is what dibs look like in real life. Um, this sort of glowing section at each interface of these droplets um, is where that phospholipid bilayer, which functions as an artificial cell membrane, is forming. And so the dibs in this image are formed using a phospholipid called DIFI-PC. Um, and you can see the structure of that guy down there at the bottom. DIFI-PC is really common in the literature in my field. Um, it's very easy to work with. It has a really low melting point, so it's nice and liquidy at room temperature, which makes it very easy to form these dib monolayers and bilayers. Um, but it's not very biomimetic. It's, it's a synthetic phospholipid um, based on phospholipids found in archaea, um, so not particularly relevant to trying to model mammalian cells. And so the focus of my project is to um, has been to use naturally derived phospholipids to build these droplet interface bilayers so we can use them to get some more accurate permeability predictions. So mammalian plasma membranes are generally made up of these four phospholipids with these four different head groups. So a choline head group, inositol, serine, ethanolamine, um, as well as a significant amount of cholesterol. And there are other minor components as well um, that we won't talk about today, but I'm happy to, to chat more about during the panel as well. And I want to point out about these structures as well, that um, they all have different R groups attached to these acyl chains. And in real cell membranes, there's a huge distribution of length of these carbon chains, as well as levels of unsaturation, so numbers of double bonds in those chains, um, versus a lipid like DIFI-PC, which, in which every single molecule looks exactly the same. So we want to use um, these naturally derived phospholipids um, to build droplet interface bilayers to actually do um, predict permeability on chip in our microfluidic devices. And we, do, we measure drug transport by using fluorescence microscopy. 
Um, so you hear me talk about a few of these different molecules throughout the rest of um, today, um, fluorescine, calcine, and dextrins, which are tagged with fluorescein or FITSI. So fluorescein is, is membrane permeable, um, and calcine and the FITSI dextrins are both not membrane permeable. So those function as our control experiments. And FITSI dextrins are actually used pretty commonly in the literature to um, measure leakiness or permeability of cell monolayers um, or tissues like the blood-brain barrier. So the first tissue that we were interested, that I'm interested in modeling are, is the small intestine. And this is gonna help us be able to predict oral bioavailability. So if a drug is orally administered, how much of it is actually going to be able to escape the small intestine, cross the small intestinal lining and get into the bloodstream so it can be circulated to its site of action. And so I developed a bespoke phospholipid formulation to mimic the, the lipid composition of the plasma membranes in the small intestine and successfully was able to form dibs with them, you can see on the left. I also developed sex-specific intestinal lipid for, uh, formulations. Um, we know that there's differences in drug absorption between male and female patients. And while a lot of different factors that go into this have been investigated, the role of membrane composition has not, um, has not really been highlighted in the literature before. And we can form dibs with those as well, as you can see it here on the right, right? Each section where um, you've got this kind of bilayer looking section where the droplets touch each other is where a dib is formed. So we published some of these results um, recently last year um, using this really beautiful microfluidic device that my collaborator, Alana Stevenson, um, designed that allows us to form these droplet triplets or three droplet networks um, and using the intestinal lipids. And so the bottom droplet, our, our um, donor droplet, where the fluorescein starts out, represents the ins inside of the small intestine. The next droplet represents the uh, cytosol of intestinal epithelial cells, and the third droplet represents the blood. And all of these have been the pH, the ionic strength, et cetera, have been tuned to mimic those three compartments. And from these measurements, we're able to uh, measure the change in concentration in fluorescein throughout these three compartments, as well as the flux, and the half-life of, flu of fluorescein absorption over time. And we were actually able to predict um, PAP, which is the apparent permeability coefficient, three times better um, than PAMPA, which is currently the gold standard technique for these. Okay, we were also able to form um, or to perform a lot more of these measurements using a more complex version of the intestinal lipid mixture, um, assessing the transport of fluorescein and calcine across these different bilayers. And so with lots going on, on this slide, I'm just going to highlight a few different things that are happening. So with the intestinal lipids and fluorescein, uh, which is this graph here, um, we see, as expected, based on our results from the previous slide, complete uh, absorption of the fluorescein across that barrier. And we see net, a net zero flux of calcium there, right? So all the calcium remains localized in that donor droplet. With the two sex-specific lipid formulations, we actually saw increased rates of flux and this is attributed to um, the increased proportion of unsaturated uh, phospholipids in both of those mixtures. And we also see a much, um, a much slower uh, half-life or much longer half-life, sorry, um, in the female mimetic um, intestinal lipid dibs, which really, which mirrors the, the slower drug absorption time that's been um, observed in female patients before. The next issue we're interested in modeling is the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so unlike the small intestine, you can actually buy um, total lipid extracts commercially for um, brain endothelial cells, porcine, porcine cells. And so we can get either polar brain lipids or total brain lipids. And we've tested dip formation and permeability with both of these. Um, the main difference, they have very similar um, proportions of the main phospholipids, but the total brain lipids contain a really huge proportion of unknowns, which is very interesting. Um, and we are definitely we're able to form dibs using these and did some permeability assays with these uh, different with these blood brain barrier mimetic dibs as well. So main uh, takeaway from this slide is that we see permeation of fluorescein across polar brain lipids, but not with the total brain lipids. And we see no permeation of calcine in either, which is which is great. Like, that's our control experiment. Um, and this really mirrors uh, results that have been reported in the literature before um, using polar brain lipids in PAMPA. Um, they see overprediction of the transport of charged compounds, which fluorescein is. Um, but using a more biomimetic mixture of lipids, um, that, that overprediction is not observed. And that's, again, that's mirrored here by our use of the total brain lipids. 
Um, the interesting thing, the trouble with these results is that there's a lot of unknowns in the total brain lipids. And that's my next step of, in my research is figuring out what is in there that's actually limiting, that's limiting transport that is not present in the polar brain lipids. Oops. Um, last set of control experiments we did is with these Fitzy dextrins, and you can see a net, you know, some nice flat lines here, right? We see net zero flux of either size of Fitzy dextrin, um, so 40 kilodaltons or 500 kilodaltons across either the polar or total brain lipid extract dibs. All right, on all of these over 30 minutes, um, all of the dye remains localized in those donor compartments, even though the um, and the bilayer there is still intact as well. The other interesting result that I found here is with the here at the bottom with total brain lipids using the larger um, the 500 kilodalton weight Fitzy dextrin. We see the membrane develop this really, really pronounced curvature over the incubation time at 30 minutes. And this is something that's usually only observed with asymmetric bilayers, um, which this shouldn't be in theory, right? So there's some kind of interaction happening between the dye and the lipids just coming from that donor compartment side um, that's causing um, causing the bilayer to, to sort of become misshapen over that incubation time. And that's again, another recent, recent development that I'm going to be looking into in the next couple of months. Last thing is looking at my future work, besides the things that we've already mentioned, uh, we're going to be creating dibs using uh, lipid extracts made from human cells. So we have a collaborator at the Vancouver Prostate Center who's providing us with some, who's culturing cells for us and providing us with their lipid extracts. And so these are dibs made from uh, lipids extracted from testicular Sertoli cells. And she's actually in the process right now of culturing some human brain endothelial cells and then mailing those lipids over. So very, very excited to see um, what that looks like if we're able to form dibs with them and then what kind of what kind of permeability results we're able to get from there as well. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'd like to thank Catherine Elvira, my wonderful supervisor, all of our group members, the Vancouver Prostate Center. And if you'd like to check us out on the web or on social media, here's our, our contact here as well. Thanks so much. Wonderful, thank you, Jamie. I would like to pass it over to our judges um, and give them the opportunity to ask any questions they have. Ashima, would you like to start? Oh, wait, you're on mute. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, great, great talk, Jamie. Uh, so I had, a, um, can, you, can you go back to slide six for a second, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so you did mention it briefly, but I was uh, hoping if you could talk a little bit more about these droplets, like how did you customize the composition of these droplets so that they actually mimic these biological compartments? Like was it some buffering agents, salts, like what, what all was involved in that? Cool, that's a great question. I'm hoping I can, this paper we wrote a year ago, I'm hoping I can remember each thing. But so the... Um, I think both the, both the intestinal and the cytosol compartments contain 140 micromolar of potassium chloride, and the blood contains the same concentration, but of, of sodium chloride. Um, and then the, both the intestine and, I'm gonna say this right way, yeah, the intestine is a HEPIs buffer, um, the cytosol is a phosphate buffer, and the blood is a carbonate buffer. So we wanted to make that as biomimetic as possible. Um, the, biggest, the biggest difference and the main difference is, is in pH between the three compartments. So the inside of the small intestine is slightly acidic, not as strongly acidic as maybe the stomach, but around 6.5. Um, and then the cytosol and the blood droplets are both at a pH of 7.4. And I think that's a big reason why we see um, we see really, really quick transport of the fluorescein across that first, um, that first barrier right into the, the cytosol droplet, um, because as it's, as it's diffusing across that bilayer, it's becoming um, more of the fluorescein is being deprotonated in that slightly more basic droplet. Um, fluorescein has a pKa around 6.43, um, so a larger proportion a large proportion of those molecules are dianionic in the, the cytosol droplet. So that kind of prevents them from leaking back into the intestinal droplet. Great, thank you so much. 
Wonderful Maria talk. Dimitrescu. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you so much, Jamie, for the wonderful talk and congratulations for republication. It is a, a huge milestone in your PhD, as we pretty much all know. Um, so I have, a, I have a couple of questions for you that I think are a little bit more theoretical rather than technical. Um, so my first question, I think, was inspired by your ability to customize the types of um, cells that, well, the <laughs> mimicking that you have here for both males and females. Um, but what we also know is that there are certain conditions that could also potentially uh, alter the cell structure or functionality of certain cells. So I was wondering whether or not you'd also be able to customize it for um, different types of diseases. So for cells that are affected by HIV um, or even the elderly people healthy with elderly, uh, just <laughs> an older age. I was wondering if this system or this modeling would be feasible. And if so, would it be feasible to look at permeability prediction for certain drugs like antiretrovirals or even in certain age groups like the elderly? Totally, yeah. Um, wow, I have not thought about the HIV angle on this at all before. No, so that's super interesting. Um, but we have talked about and we've looked into the aging, aging angle as well as um, looking at differences in membrane composition with people who people have been diagnosed with um, with generalized depression versus people who have not. There's also some memory differences that are that are correlated with those diagnoses as well. Um, I think that would be really doable um, because we're creating, you know, the blood brain barrier cell, uh, our dibs that we've created are, are made from these, you know, commercial lipid extracts that we can purchase, but all the intestinal cells are ones that we've sort of created in-house based on literature data from, from cell extracts. So I think modeling those differences is, would be, really important. Um, we're also, I mean, this is, hopefully I'll get some of this done before I go, but maybe this is the next student looking at the, um, the human cell lipid extracts as well. And I think there's a huge potential there for personalized medicine, like population-based, but also individualized medicine. If we can extract, you know, take, take a, a tissue sample, extract lipids from that, build a system like this and see if there's any specific differences to that patient or to a population, I think that would be really amazing as well. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so I think I just have a follow-up question on uh, about the mimicking that uh, you did for the droplet so that, um, so when you do this, like, uh, and when you're measuring this direct fluorescent intensity among these compartments, uh, does it, it can get complicated by these uh, matrix differences because you are mimicking the compartment. So I just was wondering, like, did you do any control experiments to assess those matrix effects? Yeah, so yeah, because definitely, because we have, we have different salts, they are the same concentration, at least, so we've, we've kind of, we've tried to avoid um, that kind of osmotic pressure um, as a variable. Um, and then at the different pHs as well, especially using fluorescent dyes that might, yeah, might have different fluorescence intensities in these different conditions. So do a lot of control experiments, a lot of calibration curves um, so that we can get these, uh, so that all these concentration values that you're seeing here um, have kind of been normalized for that. And we also, because there's a there's slight variation in droplet volume and artificial cell membrane surface area, et cetera, um, we normalize all the data for those conditions as well so that we can be sure that um, we're not getting yet, yeah, not getting that kind of variation between replicates. Um, and there's a little bit, you can see even up here on the top right, there's a little bit of change in droplet volume over time um, because we're doing these assays on devices that are made of uh, PDMS or polydimethyl siloxane, um, which is gas permeable. And so eventually these, if we leave these forever, these water droplets will just evaporate through the device itself. Um, so it's really important for us to um, go through and measure these droplets over time and make sure that everything is being normalized for that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So my second question has to do with pharmacokinetic metrics. I was wondering if you looked at anything else other than apparent permeability coefficient that could be assessed to determine the viability of this particular model. Um, and if you did assess for it, were they also similar to naturalistic conditions? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question as well. So we are able to do apparent permeability is the main thing because my basically my my entire project is focused on passive diffusion and only looking at yeah permeation and and drug absorption essentially. Um, we are able to get to calculate flux, um, which is maybe not as 
not used as much in the industry, but I think provides a really good um, point of comparison between different um, between different trials, especially if there's variation in fluorescence intensity as well. We can still see how much how much of that fluorescence intensity or how much of that concentration is is crossing crossing the bilayer per unit area as well. Um, and then we're also able to calculate the the half life of these absorption processes as well. And so that's something else that I'm really interested to see how things go in the future. If, if the half-life we find from here correlates with, um, you know, from, uh, yeah, half-life from more of a pharmacokinetic perspective of, you know, it's actually being distributed in the body um, and, and eliminated as well, I think that would be really, really interesting to look at in the future. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I think that's my third question. I think looks like Jamie, you partially answered it. So feel free to give a super short answer if you wish. So um, in this, uh, how to, so what do you think were the, uh, the primary driving forces for this selective diffusion uh, part that you see in this pharmacokinetic uh, compartment? Like uh, what prevents the fluorophore to diffuse back into the intercent from interocyte or diffuse back at a far reduced space, state, um, space? Mm hmm definitely a big part. Well, so I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. We chose fluorescein for some of these, um, A, because it's, it's water soluble, it's really intensely fluorescent, et cetera, but also because it's ionizable at, at the relevant pHs. And we know that a lot of drugs are weak acids and bases. And if we don't account for their ionizability and you know, their different uh, charge states, right, we're not going to see, not going to accurately predict how they're going to cross those membranes, right? The more, the more charged they are, the less they might want to actually get into those um, hydrophobic regions of the membrane. And so I think having those pH differences is a big part of the differences that we see. Um, but also the phospholipids are, are a huge player there as well. Um, I think using, using naturally derived phospholipids lets us see the differences maybe in membrane packing that wouldn't occur if we had all, all the, the same lipid, right? Which are just going to try and, and pack together as, as nicely and tightly as possible. Um, these different lipids, go back a couple of slides here. Um, you know, if these R groups were, were more drawn out here as well, if I had space for that, uh, might be a little bit more, more obvious, but they have, all have different sizes of head group. They all have different charge states as well. Um, and that's going to affect how they pack together. And then because these are all naturally derived, there's all this variation in how long are the chains, how, how saturated are they, and the levels of unsaturation especially um, affect how, how those membranes are going to pack together and how, how leaky and how permeable they'll be based on that. And then cholesterol as well is a huge, of course, like a huge um, variable there in regulating membrane fluidity, which then plays a role in, in packing and in permeability there. So you know, the, the pH is, is something we can't ignore and we want it to keep it that way um, to, to make that, uh, those compartments as biomimetic as we can. But really the key, I think the key takeaway from my whole thesis is that the lipids matter more than I think they've, they've been considered to matter in the past. Great, thank you. Thank you. And our last question to sum up this round of questions from the judges, uh, a more I guess, an overview question. So what are some of the technical or practical or financial barriers that are preventing this technology from being adopted uh, in future clinical settings? Yeah, so I'm, so I'm so glad that you asked that actually. So something that I've been working on and that has been a challenge and maybe I'm gonna try and find my, my slide here is detection of non-fluorescent compounds. So I really think that's the main thing. There's a little bit of a challenge of you know, learning to be a microfluidic researcher, um, learning these techniques, but that's, and that's kind of the case for, for any technique, any kind of assay you might develop, but detecting molecules that are not inherently fluorescent is really difficult. And so some of my work has looked at using fluorogenic tags, um, like fluoroscamine is this guy up here, um, to detect drugs that contain amines on a chip in these dips. Um, and we've seen some really weird and surprising results. We have a lot of trouble seeing fluorescent signals um, from tag or from drugs that are being tagged. So um, these images are actually from, I think 
experiments where I mix the, uh, the marker and the drug together off chip and then introduce them onto the device. And that works well. But what we'd like to do is have the drug start out in the donor compartment, the tag start or the detection, you know, uh, agents start out in the acceptor compartment so that as the drug diffuses across there, they bind and they, and they get a turn on fluorescence signal. Um, and that's something that I've really been been struggling with um, getting to work and hopefully, you know, someone someone after me is going to, to work on that as well. Um, but we see hydrolysis of the, the fluoroscamine, we see um, really low quantum yields, um, we see really slow reaction time. So we're losing our, our droplets or something else as this is going on. Um, and we're seeing, you know, less, less stable bilayers as well, but because we have to add in solvents to stabilize the, the tags and the other drugs. So I think that's, that's the main thing that needs to be, um, that main hurdle that needs to be jumped over to get this to actually be more widespread and adopted. Excellent, thank you. So that's all the questions from our judges right now. Perfect. Thank you so yeah. much. So we have a couple questions in the chat box, Jamie. So I'll just run those, <coughs> excuse me. I'll just run those by you and give you the chance to answer them. The first one is from me. This is not an area that I have any knowledge in at all. So your talk was really fascinating. Um, but I want to ask, how do you form sex specific intestinal dibs? What is the process in there to differentiate the two? Yeah, so they contain um, the same, I'm just going to rewind all the way back there. Um, they contain the same basic ratios of PC, PE, PS, PI, so those, those, four, those four major phospholipids and cholesterol. But instead of using um, kind of generic naturally derived versions of each of these, um, based, on, based on results reported in the literature um, about specific uh, fatty acid chains. So these are groups that are that are found in male and female cells. So I've sort of substituted out um, for each of these, maybe instead of naturally derived PC, they contain 22,6 PC and 20,24 PC. So different lengths of those chains and different uh, levels of unsaturation that are in there. Awesome. Thank you. Another question is, you mentioned that this experiment works better than one that is commercially available, and I believe you touched on this a little bit, but are there any plans to bring this experiment or this um, to market? You, you've touched on how the fluorescence is an issue, but I'd just like to hear a little bit more about it. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, that's definitely an issue that I think is, is possible to overcome. And they, there was just a paper from another, another DIBS group this year um, that came out looking at separating droplets after incubation and then looking at them through, um, what do they use? LCMS, so liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. Um, and so I think that's maybe pairing this technique with something else would be a workaround for the, the fluorescence issue as well. Um, but I think otherwise, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see if this is something that becomes more um, commercializable. We have a patent for this technology. So there's definitely, we have some, some toes in the water there as well. Um, but there, there's also some issues of, of kind of becoming an expert in microfluidics as well that um, I'm curious to see if, you know, is that something that just becomes more widespread as microfluidics becomes more, more popular in, in academia and in the industry? Um, or maybe there's a way of doing this in the same really nice controllable manner, but, but off chip, but using the same membrane technology. Awesome, thank you. Now, question here, um, can this be applied in a wide range in oncology? Yeah, we have some interesting um, preliminary, so this is not my work, but my, but Alana who designed um, this, this device here um, also works on DIPS. She's in our, in our group as well. Um, and has just published some really cool stuff looking at permeation in, um, in DIPS that mimic cancerous and non-cancerous cells. So looking at the, and the loss of asymmetry that goes with, with that. So I think that there's um, definitely, I mean, there's, def there's already some initial findings that this is a really good platform for modeling those membrane changes that arise um, in cancerous cells. And I touched on earlier a bit as well. I think there's a huge potential for DIBs to be used for individualized medicine. So I'm wondering if there's a way to 
where I think there will be a way to use lipid extracts from specific tumors or specific other cancerous cells, um, you know, circulating cancer cells, um, to then look at their lipid composition and look at their permeability and probably from more besides that as well, anything to do with their, their lipid biophysics. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question is, is this applicable to neurodrugs in view of the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, um, and so that was something that I, you know, it's the detection, that fluorescence detection issue again, that has kind of been a barrier, a blood-brain barrier um, for me uh, in making that happen, because we're really interested in seeing, um, yeah, is there, can we use these platforms to both like predict the permeability of drugs that we would like to uh, get across the blood-brain barrier, so targeting neurodegenerative diseases, um, and also um, predict, um, you know, predict central nervous system toxicity, anything like that for drugs that we, we don't want to cross that barrier. Um, we just have a new Frontiers grant actually to look at, um, to look at blood brain barrier permeability using DIVs as well as liposomes. So trying to create liposomes on chip and create um, barriers of those using, well, hopefully now we've figured out that the total brain lipids actually work better or maybe those, those human lipid extracts. Um, and so we have a new, a new grad student and a postdoctoral researcher who are, are starting to work on that in our group as well, but using some of my preliminary findings. Very cool. Our final question right now are, how are the plots of flux versus time being generated? Where does this fit to the data come from? Yeah, so I'll go to those here. So what's happening is we're using, um, you know, many, many replicates, but the images here are just representative images um, and measuring the fluorescence intensity in each of those compartments over time. And then that intensity is being normalized for um, the droplet volume as well as our, and then, yeah, the and then we're calculating flux from that. So calculating the slope of that line of change in fluorescence intensity. And all of these plots, um, are our flux out of the donor droplet. So that's why we're getting these negative values, right? Because it's going in the, from, you know, the, yeah, from the donor compartment into the acceptor compartment. And that's, we've just chosen that to be the negative direction. Um, and then from, so from the slope of those lines, that's then being normalized for the area of the, or divided by the area of the, um, of the DIB or the artificial cell membrane. So we're getting, um, you know, how much fluorescence intensity or how much concentration is moving across that um, is moving across that membrane per unit time. And then these are plotted on, oh yeah, go back there. Um, they're plotted on a log scale as well. So we get that really nice curve. And then we're fitting that, that's all being plotted in origin and then fitting an exponential curve to that data. Wonderful, thank you. And we just had another question came in. Um, sorry if I missed this, but do you, have you compared your model with any preclinical models? So you've compared it mostly with PAMPA. Um, so here, so I'm on this, the perfect slide for this as well. Um, in this paper, we showed a threefold improvement in the prediction of apparent permeability versus PAMPA. And those are in comparison, I think, to ex vivo studies using rat, um, rat intestinal cells as well, or rat intestinal tissue. Um, I think they were off by an order of magnitude using PAMPA to predict the um, to predict the permeation of fluorescein, and we were three times closer um, to the actual to the actual value from those ex vivo studies. Um, and that kind of comparison, I think, is what's um, going to be the the end of my PhD here with the rest of my data. Um, we can get some more quantitative predictions there, but we do know that a couple of things that I'll touch on. We do know that we're able to see. Um, we see a longer half-life with these female mimetic intestinal um, membranes, which mirrors that same um, slower drug absorption in female patients. And with the blood-brain barrier, we see the same effect as in PAMPA that using the polar brain lipids has. So an over-prediction of permeability um, when some of those unknown lipid membrane components are, are removed and ignored. Um, we see, you know, the, that permeation is still much lower than what we see with the intestinal lipids, um, but in comparison to total brain lipids and hopefully the human brain lipids as well, um, we see the same trend that um, is observed using PAMPA. 
Thank you. That was all of our questions from our audience. So I'd just like to turn back to our judges for a second and see if anything else has come up for you that you'd like to ask. You're both good? Cool. Well, then I would like to thank you. I thank our judges and thank you, Jamie, for your wonderful presentation. And I just have a few closing remarks. So I'm just going to share my screen again. Can you see this? No. My sponsor screen? Not yet, no. Yeah. Hmm. How about now? Very good. Yes, you do. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so oh, come on. you can do it. Was it this one? Anyways, uh, yeah, I just want to say that the science symposium wouldn't be possible without the assistance of our sponsors here. So we have Northwestern University, Vancouver, and they have a 95 employment rate for biotechnology graduates. If you'd like to check that out, if anyone's interested. We have Admare, and they are. Um, Fantastic if you want to polish your skills in business or science. They have a bunch of really great programs. Absolera has joined us and they very famously have discovered the antibody that neutralizes the viral variants of COVID-19. We also have Akika's Therapeutics and their lipid nanoparticle delivery system is a key element in the development of the Pfizer vaccine. Microsoft has also joined us and if you're looking for internships in IT, they're a great place to start. And we also have Molly Surgical, and they use cutting edge magnetic technology to provide breast cancer patients with a better experience with over, with, over the traditional wire. Now we do have some more, um, uh, sorry, science symposium events coming up. You can either find those on our Eventbrite, or you can head on over to our website at squist.ca forward slash events, and you'll be able to find all of our upcoming events there. The next science symposium event is on July 7th, and I hope you can all come and watch that. And if you're looking for any updates on the science symposium, you can head on over to our website and we have the booklet there and that will be periodically updated with all of the latest information. So, oops, with that, I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> And yeah, I just wanted to give the judges a chance to give any closing remarks they may have. And thank you once again, Jamie, for joining us today and giving us your fantastic presentation. Great, thank you. I don't have any final remarks other than congratulations and a job well done, Jamie. And I wish you the best of luck for your defense. Absolutely. Great job, Jamie. Nice presentation and good luck. Are you, uh, are you defending soon? Yes, we just set a date for August 9th. So I submitted my, oh, submitted my thesis. Good luck. Yep, very soon. <laughs> good luck with Thank you. Wonderful. <clears throat> well, I know Noeen is here, so I'll see if she has any closing remarks that she'd like to add. Uh, no, not really. So it was a wonderful talk, Jamie. I, I really like it. A very good project. And wish you all the best for your defense. And keep in touch. And that's it. And thanks to the judges who took such uh, some time for our symposium. I know they are both very busy people, like in their jobs and also in their studies. And thanks, Ashley, for moderating this uh, event today. And also, I would like to say thanks to your grandparents. They are here. <laughs> I can see their video. So it's a big support from the family, you know. So. Oh no, we may have lost her right at the end. Her internet hasn't been great. But we will leave it, we'll leave it at that and we'll let you all go. Thanks again. And we'll chat again soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will stop recording. <laughs> I'm just yeah, I'm good idea too.